So, uh, hello everyone. This is uh, uh, Armida Mucci, professor of psychiatry at the University of Campania, Luigi Valvitelli, Naples, Italy. So, it is a pleasure for me to introduce this uh, symposium uh, that we presented for the um, IUP uh, meeting of this year. So the symposium title is Do Mental Disorder Serve on EG Ways? Pathophysiological Mechanisms Revised. So the title points to the fact that electrophysiology methods uh, like EG, ERP, microstate analysis, and other uh, important aspects of electrophysiological research might be instrumental to understand the pathophysiological mechanism of mental disorders and might be used as biomarkers for these disorders to better characterize them from a diagnostic but also from a prognostic point of view. So it is really a pleasure to be here with a very important panel of uh, um, speakers uh, that will present uh, results concerning uh, drug addiction, Alzheimer disease, psychotic disorders, and illustrate how electrophysiological methods are progressing toward a better characterization of these disorders. So the first speaker will be uh, Professor Claudio Babioni. He is associate professor at the Sapienza University, uh, professor of physiology. He is the chair of the electrophysiological professional interest area of Alzheimer uh, Association, the Alzheimer Association, and he will present uh, the cortical sources of resting EEG states rictus in uh, Alzheimer, Parkinson's, and Levy body diseases. Please, uh, Claudio, give your speech. Thanks, uh, Professor Armida Mucci, for this uh, introduction and inviting me to this con um, conference and the symposium. Uh, you can see in the first slide the, the author, co-authors of this presentation. The diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and dementia and dementia with Levy bodies is performed on the basis of uh, um, biomarkers and uh, clinical manifestations. You can see in the left part of the, present, the slide, the uh, clinical criteria uh, for the identification and diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and dementia, you see that uh, the clinical features are um, the amnestic syndrome, memory deficits of episodes as a, a more frequent presentation of the disease, but you can see also logopanic symptoms in the language area or visual spatial or visual less frequently. Uh, but the specific diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease based on the recent uh, guidelines of Alzheimer's Association um, imply the major in vivo of uh, um, amyloid accumulation in the brain by positron emission tomography of cerebrospinal fluid uh, sample analysis. Um, the presence of this measurement in vivo is uh, crucial to have a specificity uh, in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. On the right side of the slide, you can see the diagnostic criteria for dementia with Levy body, according to uh, recent guidelines by uh, McKate and colleagues. And you see that it's uh, crucial, the identification of uh, core clinical features, such as the fluctuation of cognitive status over time, 
and uh, visual hallucinations or REM sleep behavioral disorders, at least two features or more. And then also Parkinsonism and in the, in the motor domain. And uh, uh, you see that in the recent guidelines, uh, you, you can have some uh, um, uh, indicative biomarkers of uh, dementia with Levy bodies, uh, with uh, that scan for dopamine transporter uh, imaging with PET or SPECT, or uh, REM sleep disorders, or uh, um, the, the imaging of a cholinergic system at the myocardial uh, level. Um, Notably, you can see that the um, also resting state, uh, e.g. rinse, uh, recording during quiet wakefulness, are considered as a, um, an important indication, supportive indication of Alzheimer's disease, uh, of uh, dementia with Levy bodies. So you see that uh, for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, it's crucial to have a, a in vivo measurement of uh, amyloid accumulation in the brain or tauopathy in the brain or neurodegeneration and brain atrophy based on uh, structural magnetic resonance imaging or um, uh, fluoro desoxical glucose positron emission tomography. In, a, in, in this presentation, we propose uh, um, uh, an enrichment of this biomarker panel with uh, a measure of a resting state uh, electroencephalographic rinse uh, to probe um, the neurophysiological basis of uh, vigilance in quiet wakefulness. And you see here in the bottom of the slide, uh, um, a subject during uh, the resting state EEG recordings in the armchair is uh, awake, but uh, relaxed. And we can measure the ability to maintain the vigilance stable for a few minutes during the EEG recordings. And uh, um, so uh, in the, this condition, this, the subject can experience a transition from uh, um, quiet vigilance to drowsiness or even light sleep. So this uh, is, is a way to uh, measure the neurophysiological oscillatory activity of the brain to maintain the vigilance for a few minutes as required at eyes closed or eyes open. And, uh, and uh, German uh, psychiatrist Hans Berger in, uh, in the, uh, 1929 published the first uh, evidence of electroencephalographic recordings in the resting state condition in uh, humans. And you can see um, uh, an example of the signals that you can recall during resting state EEG um, recordings. You see in the red frame, um, the um, electroencephalographic waves during a, a resting state, eyes closed. And you see an ample oscillations in the range of 8, 13 Hertz called alpha rinse. Hans Berger was the first to name alpha rinse, this background ample oscillations in, uh, this, in the scalp recording uh, during EG recordings. And you can see that when you have um, um, a change of the vigilance with an increase of uh, uh, alertness, you can see the, the disappearance of alpha rinse and uh, the appearance of uh, uh, EG oscillations at higher frequencies, beta and gamma from 20 to 80 Hertz. In contrast, if there is a, a, a drop of vigilance to drowsiness or light sleep or deep sleep, you can see that you have a changes in the EG waves with uh, very low frequencies uh, during deep sleep. 
So EG is a, a really um, fine procedure to measure in vivo the oscillatory neurophysiological basis of vigilance and transitions. So the uh, heuristic added value of uh, resting state EG recordings at eyes closed is to uh, probe the uh, neurophysiological oscillatory mechanism enabling uh, the maintenance of a quiet vigilance in wakefulness. And uh, um, I want to stress that you cannot uh, 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 have this kind of a measure of brain function with the PET or magnetic resonance imaging or uh, neuropsychological testing. And you see here the work of Alexandre Luria um, around the 1970s with the working brain, a book illustrating the, the um, uh, brain theory, uh, um, including three units of the brain. The first unit was related to uh, maintenance of brain arousal and vigilance. And you see that the main structures are the reticular formation in the brainstem and um, with the locus ceruleus, noradrenergic ascending um, projections to the uh, brain and or serotoninergic projection to the brain or um, uh, dopaminergic ascending projections. And you see also in the uh, basal for brain in yellow, ascending a neuromodulatory uh, system using uh, acetylcholine. And uh, all these systems are able to uh, modulate the thalamocortical interactions. And uh, in um, quite big uh, wakefulness, you, they generate half a rims in the brain. The point of this presentation is that these neurophysiological systems uh, underpinning the, 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 the vigilance and maintenance of a quiet vigilance are crucial to have a, a good quality of life because people can uh, remain awake and have some conversations uh, um, following uh, TV programs. And um, these systems are impaired by Alzheimer's disease even in the early stages. Our approach for the study of uh, cortical sources of resting state, e.g. in Alzheimer's disease uh, patients and the related disorders is based on the recording from 1020 system, 19 electrodes in the scalp, the selection of artifact-free e.g. periods uh, um, used as an input for Illoreta freeware software estimating the cortical sources of EG activity. And then we use large regions of interest in, in the cortical space um, to take into account the low resolution of our procedure. And here you can see in the framework of a European project of Pharmacog, uh, a validation in which we compare the cortical sources of a resting state EEG in an Alzheimer's disease patient with my cognitive impairment as revealed by cerebrospinal fluid biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease against people with uh, uh, my cognitive impairment not due to Alzheimer's disease in blue. And you can see in the vertical axis, the activity of the sources in the horizontal axis, the frequency band from Delta to Gamma and also the um, cortical regions of interest in the illoreta space, frontal, central, parietal, occipital, temporal. And you see in red Alzheimer's disease, my cognitive impairment, having a, um, a lower cortical activation in alpha rims when compared to my cognitive impairment not due to Alzheimer's disease in blue. So Alzheimer's um, uh, disease, uh, my cognitive impairment is related to uh, a drop of uh, um, cortical sources of alpha rims in the parietal occipital areas and uh, um, an increase of uh, uh, delta sources in the temporal areas. 
And this is a validation in relation to cerebrospinal diagnostic biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. And then another uh, testing is, uh, was performed in Alzheimer's disease patients with dementia. We recorded the EEG in um, the baseline condition. And then after one year, you see the, now the sub subtraction of the cortical source activity in the two recordings. Zero means stable cortical source activity. When you see negative values, you see a reduction of cortical source activity at the follow-up after one year of cholinergic ther therapy with the donepezil. And you see that uh, uh, in alpha rings in the occipital and temporal areas, so you have a clear drop of cortical sources of alpha rings. In uh, red, the Alzheimer's disease with dementia, non responding clinically to donepezil therapy for one year, and you see a, a dramatic drop of alpha. But you see also a, a, a drop of alpha even in the Alzheimer's disease patients with dementia responding clinically um, to, to donepezil therapy for one year. So you see that this uh, uh, cortical source activity is sensitive to cholinergic therapy in Alzheimer's disease with dementia. And then we have other va um, validation with uh, um, uh, the correlation between uh, um, cortical sources of uh, delta rims in the resting state is closed in Alzheimer's disease with dementia and indexes of uh, hypometabolism of the cerebral cortex as revealed by positron tomission tomography. And you see that uh, the higher the, the hypometabolism indexes of uh, PET FDG and the higher the abnormal pathological uh, global delta source activity. We use two standard indexes of uh, FDG PET hypometabolism. And similar results were obtained uh, with the correlation between global delta source activity in, uh, by L L Loretta and uh, the uh, volume of gray matter of silver cortex as revealed by magnetic resonance imaging. You see that the higher the cortical gray matter volume and uh, the, the higher is alpha rins, which is uh, uh, in the sources, which is uh, a sign of a healthy brain. And uh, the higher the uh, gray matter volume in the cerebral cortex in, in the patients and uh, the lower is the pathological global delta source activity. And uh, uh, we also moved the research with the comparison of uh, cortical sources of resting state EG activity uh, in Alzheimer's disease patients with dementia in relation to uh, patients with dementia due to cerebrovascular disease or levy body diseases. And uh, um, you see here the results of the comparison between uh, cortical sources of resting state, e.g. rims at eyes closed in normal elderly subjects, Alzheimer's disease patients with mild dementia, and uh, dementia due to cerebrovascular disease. And you see that in normal subjects, the dominant source activity in red color uh, is in alpha band, in the posterior areas, the nose up. There is a dramatic decrease of alpha sources in the posterior areas in uh, Alzheimer's disease patients with mild dementia. And uh, you see a really um, um, uh, almost normal alpha source activity in uh, cerebrovascular dementia. And in cerebrovascular dementia, you have an increase in a theta source activity in red and in delta when compared to normal subjects. In Alzheimer's disease, you have also an increase in delta source activity widespread. Another demonstration was in the comparison with patients with dementia with levy body in violet, Parkinson's disease dementia in green, and Alzheimer's disease with dementia in red. 
you see again that the normal elderly subjects in blue show the highest alpha cortical source activity in the parietal, temporal, and occipital areas. Also in the limbic space of illurata uh, source activity. And then you have a dramatic drop in red in the group of Alzheimer's disease with dementia in the posterior areas. Um, a, a clear drop, even uh, not so strong as Alzheimer's disease with dementia in violet group, the dementia with Levy body. And you have a, a decrease of alpha source activity, even in Parkinson's disease with dementia, but less evident than in the other two groups of patients. And uh, uh, you see that uh, concerning the delta source activity, you have an, a pathological increase in uh, Alzheimer's disease with dementia, but even more in uh, uh, dementia with Levy body and even more in uh, Parkinson's disease with dementia. So you see that uh, at the group level, you have differences in uh, uh, patients with dementia due to different neurodegenerative diseases. And we could also demonstrate some nice individual classification of normal subjects when compared to the patients with dementia with rock curve techniques around 0 0.8, 0 0.85 um, accuracy in the discrimination with normal subjects. And you see here um, uh, or that we have similar results when we compared Alzheimer's disease with my cognitive impairment with dementia with, with the uh, Levy body, patients with my cognitive impairment. And you see that when compared to normal subjects in blue, we have a, a clear a drop in Alzheimer's disease MCI and uh, um, uh, less evident drop in uh, Levy body with my cognitive impairment and an increase of delta source activity in the posterior areas greater in uh, uh, Levy body MCI when compared to Alzheimer's disease patients with microcognitive impairment. So similar results to dementia, but less um, uh, magnitude of the drop. And exactly the same results were obtained with Parkinson's disease my cognitive impairment. Even in this case, we have the, the, the greater drop is in Alzheimer's disease MCI when compared to Parkinson, but similar results with dementia. So I can conclude that uh, in Alzheimer's disease, uh, uh, you have a, a drop of alpha rins related to the control of cortical inhibition, um, which is related to ample alpha rins in the resting state. And in Parkinson's disease, the, the, the most important feature is the increase of delta rims. And uh, uh, dementia with Levy body is halfway with uh, features similar to the two groups. This is my uh, work group. I thank to them for this work. And these are our um, sponsors of research. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Baglioni, for this very interesting uh, uh, speech that really demonstrated the validity of the EEG biomarkers in uh, the field of uh, dementia diagnosis and prognosis, if I can understand. So the symposium has a nice gender balance because we have two male and two female speakers and also a balance in the, uh, let's say the old and junior <laughs> researchers. So we have uh, senior researchers and as well as two uh, junior researchers. Um, so the next speaker is uh, Professor uh, Salvatore Campanella. He is a senior research associate, University of Brussels, Belgium, uh, Brugman Hospital, and uh, he uh, directs the Laboratory of Psychological Medicine and Addiction in this university, and he is also a member of. Uh, the board of directors of the EEG and uh, uh, Clinical Neuroscience uh, uh, Society, ECMS. So it is a pleasure to introduce his speech. 
um, that is alcohol abuse and brain excitability as revealed by EEG and non-invasive brain stimulation. Please, Salvatore, you can give your speech. Okay, hi everybody. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, Professor Mucci for inviting me to this very interesting symposium. And I just will try to show you some uh, preliminary data showing how uh, EEG and uh, non-invasive brain stimulation such as TDCS can be helpful in the uh, management of uh, alcoholic uh, patients. So I have nothing uh, to disclose. Um, as you know, uh, alcohol dependence is a really huge worldwide health problem. And when we are clinicians and we have to face with uh, alcoholic patients, a main problem is the relapse rates. Uh, indeed, it is well known that despite uh, medication, despite uh, psychosocial support, uh, uh, every recently detoxified alcoholic patient uh, relapse in the three months uh, following uh, uh, detoxification. So 50% of these patients relapse in the three months uh, post detox. And if we go uh, to observe what happens uh, one year later detoxification, we can observe that 70 to 90% of these patients have relapsed. So of course, psychotherapy is important. Of course, anti-craving medication is important, but we also think that it is really important to identify the neurocognitive mechanism that can also trigger abstinence uh, versus uh, relapse. In this view, last decades have put uh, in evidence two main neurocognitive mechanisms that are well known to trigger uh, addictions. A first me mechanism is called the atten attentional bias towards drug cues, which is also known as a cue reactivity mechanism, which is combined with a lack of inhibitory uh, resources. Uh, what we can say in general is that alcoholic patients are more attracted, will treat more intensely all types of alcohol cues because these cues have huge motivational salience for these patients. And this more uh, attractive power of alcohol cues is combined with a lack of inhibitory skills. So this bad balance between a more intense, a more powerful attentional bias combined with less resources to inhibit uh, motor response is, uh, can trigger a relapse in these patients. A main problem is also that we have no idea about the potential effect of all kinds of anti-craving medications on these neurocognitive processes. And our main idea here is to use cognitive event-related potentials, cognitive ERP, ERPs, as biomarkers of abstinence versus relapse during the detoxification program. So as you know, ERPs have two main uh, variables, important variables. It could be amplitude, which reflects more the intensity of the neural processing, and the latency, which reflects more the speed of the processing. Our study on alcoholic patients will be based on two main cognitive ERP tasks. The first task is a contextual go-no-go -no -go task. In this task, we have 80% of go trials, which is the letter M, and uh, the instruction is to quick as quickly as possible uh, on a button when this letter M will appear. But sometimes, 20% of the time, we have a no-go trial. And for that no-go trial, you should inhibit your response. You should inhibit to click on the button. The main point here is that this task can be uh, displayed on three different con contexts, neutral, alcohol-related context, and non-alcohol-related context. So just to show you quickly what is the task about, uh, you can see here you have to click when you see the letter M and avoid, inhibit your movement, your response when the letter W appear. This task is really important because it will trigger a 
the ERP level, the no-go P3 component, which is a neural correlate of the inhibition process. When you inhibit correctly your motor response, you will generate, your brain will generate this frontocentral response, which is known as the no-go P3 component. A second task is the oddball alcohol-related task. And here, you have also frequent stimuli, here a guy drinking water, but this time you should do nothing when the frequent stimulus appear. However, when the target 20% of the time appear, you have two types of target stimuli, the same guy drinking a soft or the same guy drinking alcohol. And you have to click as quickly as possible when the target stimuli will appear on the screen. So here, just to illustrate you the task, you see here the guy drinking water, you do nothing. But sometimes when the deviant target appear, you have to, quick, to click as quickly as possible on the button. Here, the guy drinking a soft. Or the same guy drinking uh, alcohol. This task is really important also because it will trigger a well-known ERP component known as the oddball P3 component. And we know that this component is more important when you have to click uh, on alcohol-related uh, stimuli when you are an alcoholic patient. So if you would like to have more details on this task, you can go to check uh, uh, these two uh, papers. But today I will show you some preliminary data in a study in which we have uh, two recordings of these two ERP tasks. Indeed, we have patients uh, who came in our hospitals, hospital to have a detoxification program. The detoxification is around four weeks, uh, and then you stay in the hospital, you have withdrawal, you have psychotherapy support, and you have anti-craving medication. You have four groups here. But the important point for today is that all these patients will have two ERP sessions dealing with the two tasks I just, I just show you. At T1, just after withdrawal, four to five days after starting the detoxification program, and a T2 after re receiving three weeks of drug treatment, a mean of 20 days uh, of treatment. The point here is that we would like to observe the evolution of the no-go P3 component and of the oddball P3 component during the detoxification, and to see if that evolution can be linked to abstinence or relapse when they leave hospital and they go home. So here we have 40 patients. And uh, on the 40 patients, we have a follow-up procedure which help us to do subgroups of patients who will remain abstainers three months after the detoxification program and who have relapse in the three months following this uh, detoxification program. So uh, on these 40 patients, you can see that three months later, we have 15 abstainers and 25 relapsers. And the point here is that we would like to check if the evolution of the no-go P3 component and of the oddball P3 component can help us to predict who will three months later remain abstinent or will relapse in alcohol drinking. An important point is here is that we control for a lot of variables, gender, age, depression, craving, but also, it is not noted here, but also anxiety, impulsivity. And none of these variables can help us to predict which patients will remain abstinent and which one will relapse in alcohol drinking. However, if we check the ERP evolution of the ERP components, we have here some prediction. Indeed, for the oddball P3 components, you have in picked lines the session one, T1, and in dot line the session two, four relapsers and for the target related to alcohol and the targets non-related to alcohol. What you can observe is that in all condition, you have a reduction of the amplitude of the P3 component at T2 compared to T1, but not for abstainers and for alcohol cues. 
such as here. So you have the same uh, intensity of the P3 component bet between T1 and T2, but only for abstainers and only for the alcohol target cues. Also, if we check for the no-go task, we can see that we can we also have a decrease of the no-go P3 component in all conditions for relapsers, for alcohol cues, and for non-alcohol cues. However, we have only for the abstainers and only for the alcohol contexts an increase of the no-go P3 component between T1, T2 as compared to T1. So as preliminary conclusions, we can say that we have here some evolution of the P3 component and of the no-go P3 component that can help us to predict which patients will remain abstinent and which one will resume in alcohol drinking in the three months following detoxification. Indeed, thanks to the ERP oddball task, it seems that keeping the same intensity of processing towards alcohol cues could be uh, seen as a protective fact factor for recently detoxified alcoholic patients. However, increasing the intensity of processing towards alcohol cues at the inhibitory level could be a protective fa factor also in these uh, patients. So the combination of these two components, the same processing but with higher inhibitory resources, can be seen as, as something at the neurocognitive level protecting from uh, relapse in the three months following detoxification. Of course, we, we have to remain cautious to the small sample size, but it seems to us that it's really important to screen for the evolution of some important neurocognitive mechanisms that are known to be involved in addiction and in triggering relapse, as this could help clinicians to orient post-detox programs. Indeed, I will show quickly uh, some preliminary data to a study in which I, I, co in which I collaborate with, uh, with a PhD student, uh, Masha Dubuzon, which who is supervised by my colleague uh, Xavier Noel. And in that uh, study, uh, they try to combine active TDCS with uh, cognitive training of inhibition in uh, alcoholic patients facing with detoxification. So they use the same procedure. Some, uh, they also have access to uh, alcoholic patients who came in the hospital in our unit to have detoxification during four weeks. And uh, these patients uh, were randomly assigned to four different groups. Uh, in, in these groups, you could have active uh, inhibitory training or active uh, TDCS. So if you have active inhibitory training, you will uh, be trained to inhibit the go uh, response. So you will train to no go response to alcohol cues compared to non-alcohol cues. And if you have active TDCS, you will have an active uh, stimulation of the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So you could have active TDCS and active inhibitory training. And in that task, we expect to have the most uh, effect on these uh, patients. So the most impact on the abstinence of these patients uh, following the detoxification. So you can have active TDCS or sham TDCS if you are in another group. And if you have active cognitive training, you will be trained to disclose a no-go response when you are facing with an alcohol stimuli. Or uh, if you are, have a non-active cognitive training, you will be confronted to sports stimuli or a neutral stimuli. So the idea here is to try to uh, observe whether combining active TDCS on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex with an inhibitory training of the no-go response to alcohol cues can uh, trigger abstinence in the weeks uh, following uh, detoxification in our alcoholic patients. So uh, it was a 
quite important study and as you can see here you we have 119 patients we were that were included in our final uh, sample we have a lot of uh, variables we checked for depression anxiety impulsivity etc but you uh, i will just show you some interesting preliminary data as did this that study is currently uh, submitted for a publication. A main important thing is that on these 119 patients, two weeks uh, after the detoxification, so when they leave the hospital, we can observe that 88 patients were still abstinent two weeks later, and already 30, uh, 31 patients uh, will abs. But what we can see is that it seems that appear a TDCS effect as uh, patients who are in the group with the active TDCS less uh, show relapse two weeks after. Indeed, we can see that we have a 20% reduction in the relapse rate only in the active TDCS group at two weeks. So you can see here is you have TDCS, you have less relapse or more abstinence than if you did also only have cognitive training. Interestingly, you can say that uh, if you use a survival analysis on the TDCS condition, this effect on abstinence, as abstinence remain significant for 40 days after detoxification. And very interestingly, we can also see that if we use a logistic regression uh, on uh, two weeks post discharge, comparing the active TDCS plus active cognitive training group to the other three groups, we have a significant difference showing that the combination of active TDCS seems be uh, with uh, active cognitive training on inhibition and alcohol cues is the best way to uh, to uh, have a kind of abstinence to promote abstinence in the two weeks following post -detox detoxification in these patients so a short summary on these uh, study can uh, show you that we, it seems that we have a specific effect of the TDCS on early relapse, so two weeks post discharge of the hospital. Indeed, we show a 20% reduction in the relapse rate in the active TDCS condition compared to the SHEM TDCS condition two weeks after treatment. Uh, analysis show a reduction in relapse two weeks after the treatment and survival analysis show a reduction in relapse during the 40 days after the treatment. And it's also appear that TDCS combined with active cognitive training on inhibition on alcohol cues show a small advantage effect when uh, hierarchical analysis were performed. However, no specific effect was showed with cognitive training alone. And it seems that cognitive training should be combined with active, active TDCS to have a short-term impact on the relapse rate in these recently det detoxified alcoholic patients. So these are only some preliminary results and the study is currently submitted uh, for publication by uh, the PhD student, uh, Masha Dubuzon. However, to conclude, I can say that ERP data may be really useful to follow the evolution of the main neurocognitive mechanisms involved in abstinence versus relapse during the detoxification program in these alcoholic patients, and that this could help us to primarily orient high-risk patients towards these kinds of combined TDCS cognitive training procedure that could boost uh, inhibition in these uh, post detox program. Of course, if you need some information, if you have some questions or some comments on what I show you today, you can send me an email and I will uh, really thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Salvatore, for your speech. So it is a pleasure now to introduce um, Renate de, Bo de Boc. Uh, who is a um, PhD researcher, so a junior researcher, 
uh, at the University Psychiatry Clinic in Basel, Switzerland. And uh, she will present the resting state EG microstates in psychotic disorders. Please, uh, Renate. All right. Um, yes, welcome. Thank you for listening or tuning in to my talk today. And thank you, Professor Mucci, for inviting me to this symposium. Um, today, I will present um, about EEG resting state microstates in psychotic disorders. First, I will give a little bit of background information where I explain what EEG microstates are before going into more detail about EEG microstates in psychotic disorders. So, um, Maybe you already know what EEG microstates are, or maybe you don't. But what is evident is that there are more and more studies on EEG microstates. Um, the first publications of microstate was already in 1987, but um, only since some years, there has been an increase in published studies. So as you can see here, in 2010, we're only about 10 studies. And this number has been increasing to already 53 studies this year. And studies investigating EEG microstates are not only doing this in, in psychotic disorders, but it's actually a various um, area of patient groups. So also in Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, alcohol abuse, and many more patient groups. So I don't want to go into the methodological details of microstates. But I do want to explain how microstates fit in compared to other measures of EEG, specifically in the field of psychotic disorders. So for a long time, there were roughly two ways to analyze EEG data. On the first hand, we have the task-related data um, or event-related potentials, ERPs. Many studies show ERP abnormalities in patients with psychotic disorders, often showing decreases in amplitudes in different peaks. In addition to this, we have um, uh, EEG can all, uh, we have resting states. So EEG can also record spontaneous brain activity as we've seen in the previous presentation. And we can use this resting state, resting state data to um, extract different kinds of information. For example, looking at the different frequency bands in the EEG. And if you want to know more, about um, EEG-based message, message, measures in schizophrenia, I recommend to read this um, recent review paper. So the two methods that I just described um, are not really capturing the global connectivity of the brain. And that's where EEG microstates come in. So EEG micro microstates <clears throat> actually um, show the spatial configuration of the scalp global field power. Um, the configurations are made up using all the electrodes that are used in the EEG. And these, stable conf and these configurations appear to be stable before rapidly shifting to another configuration. They are stable for about 50 to 120 milliseconds and hence the name microstates. Typically, the microstates are described uh, related to four different configurations. They are named A, B, C, and D. And about 10 years ago, there were some simultaneous EEG and fMRI studies that compared the, these different configurations to the resting state networks that we know from fMRI. They showed that microstate A was related to a phonologically and verbal processing network, microstate B to a visual imagery network, microstate C to the salience network, and microstate D to the switching and reorientation of attention. But that's, of course, not all. When we want to do some research with microstates, we have to extract some parameters to say meaningfully things about them. So if we have, for example, a recording um, with the different configurations here in colors, we can look at three different parameters. For example, the occurrence, where we just count the number of occurrence of a specific configuration. We can look at the duration, where we calculate the mean duration of all these configurations and the time coverage, the percentage that a um, certain configuration is present. In terms of um, simplicity, I will just use time coverage when I present uh, later results. 
So, so far about the background. Now getting into the EEG microstates in psychotic disorders. Um, in 2016, there was a meta-analysis by Rieger that showed microstate alterations to be consistently reported across patients with psychotic disorders. Um, as you can see here on the top, um, this is about microstate C. Um, we can see that there's an increase in microstate C um, coverage in patients compared to controls. On the opposite, we have microstate D, where we can see a decrease of microstate D in patients compared to controls. Most of these studies compared patients with healthy controls or high-risk patients with patients in healthy controls, but no one really looked at high-risk patients considering future uh, transition status. So the next question is, what about these transitions? And this is important because when it comes to um, the course of psychotic disorders, there's often a prodromal phase that unseats uh, the first psychotic symptoms. And using specific um, screening tools, patients are classified as ultra high risk for psychosis or UHR. However, not everyone who's um, classified as a UHR patient will later transition to psychosis or get a psychosis diagnosis. And the transition rates are about 25%. So how can we predict transition? And that is what we are interested in. Can we also use these EEG microstates as a biomarker for transition to psychosis? So in our first study, we wanted to find out if we can use microstates to differentiate between different groups of, of patients. Um, for this study, we included different participants groups. Um, the first one is healthy controls. Then we have three patient groups. The first episode psychosis patients, FAB, ultra high risk patients with transition, and ultra high risk patients without transition. It's important to note here that the patients um, that are in the ultra high risk group are all just in this group at the time of the EEG recording. And they were followed up for three to five years. And only then um, were kind of adhered or put into this group of transition of not transition. So we have the EEG recording and the microstate analysis finished. And here we found an increase in microstate A in patients um, compared to the healthy controls. So we compared all patient groups together to the healthy controls, showing this difference in microstate E. And this kind of suggests that microstate E is a marker of general psychopathology. And this finding is in line with other studies that suggest that microstate A is psychosis independent and rather a correlate of psychological stress. We also observed a decrease of microstate B in FAB compared to the two ultra high risk patients, suggesting a state marker of illness progression. Finally, we also compared the two ultra high risk groups and there we saw that there was a decrease in microstate D in the UHR transition group to the non-transitioners. Here we suggested that this microstate um, could serve as a potential biomarker for transition. Um, so in all of, in this, in the previous study, all of the patients um, were at the time of the EEG recording medication A, so they didn't get any antipsychotic medication. But we were also interested um, in the effects of medication. So in the second study, we compared medicated versus non-medicated FAP patients. Um, and the results you can see here in blue, we have the medicated patients and in yellow, the unmedicated patients. And here we can see a decrease in microstate A for the medicated patients and an increase in microstate B for the medicated patients. And this is interesting because previous studies also showed um, increase in microstate A in unmedicated patients compared to healthy controls, and a decrease in microstate B also compared to healthy controls. So this kind of suggests that the antipsychotics might have a beneficial effect. Um, one side note, however, is that the symptom severity that we assessed with the brief psychiatric rating scale didn't differ between the two groups. 
So shortly um, to summarize what we found here, um, we do observe microstate alterations in patients with psychotic disorders and also, also in UHR. And we find microstate alterations in medicated versus unmedicated patients. What we also know from previous research is that there can be dopamine alterations observed in patients with psychotic disorders. So what we ask ourselves now is, do dopamine alterations actually contribute to these changes in microstates? Um, and it's difficult to answer this question based on previous literature. So a recent meta or systematic review um, from our group shows that there's a wide heterogeneity of results. So we found increased and decreases in functional connectivity um, related to dopaminergic, dopaminergic effects. And another limitation in many studies is that the comparisons were kind of indirect. So um, <clears throat> there was either medicated or unmedicated patients that were compared to healthy controls. And only very few studies used a pre-post design. Um, so that's what we try to do in our next studies, of which I will present uh, preliminary results today. So in the first study, um, we have a drug challenge study in healthy participants. We included 60 participants in the age of 80 to 40 years. And we used a crossover design. So each participant received one single dose of haloperidol. A uh, dopamine antagonist, a dose of L-DOPA, a dopamine agonist, and a placebo. And the washout time between measurements was at least one week. And um, the EEGs were recorded at the peak drug effects. Simultaneously, we run a longitudinal study in patients with the aim to include 38 patients. They were medication naive at the time of the first EEG recording. And then we did a second EEG recording eight weeks after antipsychotic medication. So these are the preliminary results in the healthy control group. Um, this is an analysis of 40 um, participants. We have the different classes shown here and coverage here on the y-axis. Um, in blue is L-DOPA, placebo in the middle, and then haloperidol on the right side. So as you can see, there are many um, changes due to the dopaminergic drugs. And most interestingly, the changes in L-DOPA, um, some of them, they actually reflect uh, what we see in, in patients. And when it comes to haloperidol, it's really interesting to see this increase in microstate D because this was a class that was decreased in patients. Um, and moving to the patient study, here we only um, were able to analyze half of the sample um, and we didn't find any um, changes so far. Um, this could be explained by various reasons. I mean, the sample size is still really small, um, but what we also know is that um, often microstate changes can be related to changes in symptom se severity and we didn't uh, control for this at this stage in the analysis. Then I kind of want to conclude with that EEG microstates seem to be a biomarker for psychotic disorders, and they also have the potential to be used as part of a diagnostic tool. And secondly, we show that dopaminergic changes might influence the EEG microstates. Um, but before I finish, I just want to have one small critical remark when it comes to the kind of the methodology. Uh, the different groups using different methods uh, and I think it's important that there's some kind of standardization because I think a lot of the times that we find um, this yeah contrary contradicting results between groups um, it might be due to the pre-processing pipelines using different filters for example or different settings in the microstate analysis so I really hope that this is something that's um, going to be worked on in the future so then I would like to thank my PhD advisors, Christina Andreu and Stefan Borgward, and of course my team and colleagues in Basel and Lübeck. And of course, I want to thank you for listening and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Renate.
for this very stimulating talk. And there is uh, there a, an important point of uh, how we should use the biomarkers uh, to see whether there is a link to uh, psychotic risk or prognosis, whether the, the biomarker also is a state or a trait biomarker, so the sensitivity to uh, drug effects. And I also appreciate that you um, point out that we need standardization to use, to largely use these biomarkers from electrophysiological methods. Thank you. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our next junior researcher speaker, uh, Dr. Giulia Maria Giordano. Uh, she is a um, junior researcher at the University of Campania Luigi Bambitelli, uh, in the Electrophysiology and Brain Imaging uh, Laboratory. So uh, Giulia will uh, uh, present um, the talk of EEG markers of negative symptoms uh, in schizophrenia. Please, uh, Julia. Good uh, afternoon. I'd like to thank Professor Mucci for the presentation and uh, also for organizing this uh, symposium with Professor Babiloni. So my presentation will focus on uh, electrophysiological markers uh, of negative symptoms in schizophrenia. Negative symptoms uh, represent a key aspect of schizophrenia. They are present since the early stage of the disorder and have shown an elevated stability along the course of the illness. Negative symptoms constitute a separate domain with distinct pathophysiological and therapeutic implications, and these symptoms represent today an unmet therapeutic need since they have a huge impact on real life functioning of patients with schizophrenia and they do not respond satisfactorily to current available treatments. According to the recent conceptualization of negative symptoms, they are represented by anhedonia, asociality, evolution, alogia, and blunted affect. Different factor analytic studies uh, have demonstrated that these symptoms cluster into two domains. The experiential domain, which includes anhedonia, asociality, abolition, and the expressive deficit domain, which includes alogia and blunted affect. These two domains uh, are associated with different uh, neurobiological um, underpinnings. In particular, the experiential domain is uh, mainly associated with abnormalities of brain circuits related to motivational processes, while the expressive deficit domain is probably related to deficit in neurocognition or social cognition and neurological soft signs. The use of the electroencephalography, which appears to be inexpensive, non-invasive, with the high temporal resolution, has allowed us to identify abnormalities of cortical brain functions and to investigate the neurophysiological basis of different psychopathological aspects, including negative symptoms. However, um, different uh, electrophysiological uh, studies that investigated the uh, neurophysiological basis of negative symptoms reported often inconsistent results. This might be due to the heterogeneity of negative symptoms, to the improper conceptualization of these symptoms, 
to the possible presence of confounding factors uh, such as positive symptoms, depression, disorganization, extrapyramidal symptoms, as well as to the use of different assessment instruments, often not in line with the current conceptualization of negative symptoms, and also to the small sample sizes. Um, Therefore, in order to overcome these uh, limitations within the add-on EG study of the Italian Network for Research on Psychosis, we investigated the neurophysiological basis of negative symptoms in a large sample of stabilized patients with chronic schizophrenia. This add-on uh, EEG study involved five research groups, the University of Campania Luigi Van Vitelli, the University of Salerno, the University of Foggia, the University of Rome Tor Bergata, and the University of Rome La Sapienza. Subjects underwent uh, a resting state EEG recording and uh, two auditory tasks, the M100 and P3B and the mismatch negativity P3A. Illness related and functioning related variables were assessed using state of the art instruments. In particular, we used the brief negative symptom scale, which is a second generation rating scale to assess negative symptoms the positive and negative syndrome scale to assess positive and disorganization dimensions, the Calgary depression scale for schizophrenia to assess depressive symptoms, the sentence rating scales to assess uh, extrapyramidal symptoms, the matrix consensus cognitive battery to assess cognitive impairment, and the specific level of functioning scale to assess real life functioning. Using the resting state EG microstate analysis, we found that the uh, contribution, which is the time coverage of microstate A, was uh, related to, the, um, to negative symptoms, in particular to the experiential domain and not with the expressive deficit domain. Within the experiential domain, only anticipatory anhedonia, abolition, and asociality had the same relationship with microstate A. These results demonstrate the uh, existence of different neurophysiological basis of the two negative symptoms, symptom domains and support the hypothesis um, uh, that only the anticipatory component of anhedonia shares the same correlation of the experiential domain. Using a functional cognitivity analysis, we found that the uh, expressive deficit domain was related to a hyperconnectivity in alpha band um, in alpha bands and a hypoconnectivity in gamma bands. Again, the uh, two negative symptoms domains uh, have different neurophysiological basis. We also found that the uh, M100 amplitude uh, was uh, related with uh, negative symptoms and within negative symptoms, um, only the expressive deficit domain and not the experiential domain was uh, related to the uh, N100 amplitude. Within the express, expressive deficit domain, both uh, blunted affect and allogia uh, had the same relationship with the M100 amplitude. Again, these results uh, suggest the existence of different neurophysiological basis of the two negative symptom domains. In order to increase the generalizability of previous findings within the Adoni G study of the Italian Network for Research on Psychosis, we use the machine learning analysis, which learns statistical functions from multidimensional datasets, 
with a double objective. Firstly, to build a generalizable electrophysiological model, which could be implemented in clinical practice in order to discriminate subjects with schizophrenia from healthy controls and improve precision in diagnosis of schizophrenia. And second, to explore associations of candidate EG indices with illness-related and functioning-related variables in subjects with schizophrenia. The study sample um, consisted of 113 subjects with schizophrenia and 57 healthy controls recruited at baseline. These subjects underwent the EG indices recording and the assessment of illness-related and functioning-related variables. 61 subjects with schizophrenia accepted to participate to the four-year follow-up study, and they underwent the assessment of illness-related and functioning-related variables. We performed a machine learning analysis to um, test the performance of uh, four unimodal classifiers that uh, could discriminate subjects with schizophrenia from healthy controls using single EG indices, therefore frequency bands, microstates, mismatch negativity P3A, and N100 T3B. Then we tested the uh, performance of the global classifier, which was based on the decision scores of the unimodal classifiers. And finally, we performed the correlation analysis between the global classifier score and illness-related and functioning-related variables measured both at baseline and follow-up. This is an example of machine learning pipeline. We used the uh, NeuroMiner version one to test the performance of the um, classifiers. Here I reported the demographic and clinical characteristics of the study sample. How we can see um, there was a gender imbalance between the two groups since the subjects with, with schizophrenia uh, were uh, predominantly males. In addition, subjects with schizophrenia uh, compared to healthy controls had lower education and um, they uh, had a worse performance on neurocognitive skills and also they had a, a worse functioning as expected. Now we can, we can discuss the results of the um, classifiers performance. How we can see each classifier was able to discriminate subjects with schizophrenia from LT controls with an accuracy of 71.4% 71, uh, 71 of frequency bands classifier 57.7% of microstate classifier, 66.76% uh, of the mismatch negativity classifier, 17.9% of the N100 classifier. The global classifier was able to discriminate subjects with schizophrenia from healthy controls with an accuracy of 75.4%. Uh, how we can see uh, the decisions generated by the frequency bands um, were the most important for the final classification followed by HEM100 P3B and mismatch negativity P3A, while the decisions generated by microstate classifier uh, were less important. Finally, we performed the correlations between the global classifier score and illness-related variables, including negative symptoms and functioning-related variables, measured both at baseline and follow-up. 
First, we performed a non-negative matrix factorization analysis, um, which demonstrated the existence of four factors at baseline and follow-up. Um, these factors were the um, one factor was the functioning uh, captured the functioning and cognitive disturbances. Another factor captured depressive symptoms. The third factor captured positive symptoms and Parkinsonism. And another factor captured negative symptoms, in particular blunted affect, which belong to the uh, expressive deficit domain. We did not uh, find any significant correlations between the global classifier decision score and the um, four factors at baseline. However, we um, found significant uh, correlations between the global classifier decision score and negative symptoms, depression and functioning and cognitive disturbances at the follow-up. To conclude, our results show that each classifier using different electroencephalographic indices can correctly differentiate subjects with schizophrenia from LT controls and might be potentially used to improve precision diagnosis of schizophrenia. And combining different indices recorded under different conditions, it is possible to increase the classification accuracy up to 75.4%. We found that the diagnostic model was associated with depression, functioning, and cognitive impairment, as well as negative symptoms at follow-up. We know that negative symptoms and also cognitive impairment are highly specific features of schizophrenia, are largely present at the onset of the disorder, and show an elevated stability along the course of the illness. The four electrophysiological indices that discriminated the subjects with schizophrenia from healthy controls that are related to negative symptoms and cognitive impairment suggest that the combination of these indices might be used for diagnosis at any stage of the illness and might provide prognostic information at group level. Among negative symptoms, blunted affect at four year follow up showed the strongest association with EEG abnormalities in subjects with schizophrenia. This might be due to the uh, existence uh, of uh, different uh, neurophysiological basis of the two negative symptom domains. We know that the experiential domain is uh, related to, to the motivational circuit while the expressive deficit is related to cognitive impairment, reflecting alterations in cortical brain areas that are alterations uh, uh, captured by the EEG recording. I'd like to thank my research group and the Department of Psychiatry of the University of Munich which collaborated um, for the machine learning analysis and also you for your attention. Thank you, Julia, for uh, your presentation that uh, I think gives an example of how we can use machine learning to see what discriminates that uh, two diagnostic groups, but also we should go back to see uh, what features of the disorder that is uh, uh, picked up by our uh, indices. Uh, the input to the machine learning algorithm is really uh, in, uh, in the pipeline and gives us the best discrimination because this helps us to have a more transparent uh, process of uh, discrimination and also what kind of prognostic uh, indication can be um, found with these uh, methods. So I think that uh, we are now open, the symposium is now open for the question and answers uh, uh, session. 
And uh, I will uh, really thank all the speakers to uh, have uh, really presented uh, very important findings demonstrating that this uh, highly inexpensive, cost effective measure, electrophysiological indices can be used in the pathophysiological characterization of uh, uh, mental disorders. Uh, and giving us uh, indices that can be used to also have prognostic indicators. However, we need to go further in the standardization and uh, go further in the really good clinical characterization of our mental disorders. Thank you for your attention and we are now ready to take the questions. Thank you to all the speakers and to the audience.